Welcome back. So we've been talking a lot about chemical transformations and energetic transformations in the cell. So we're going to talk also about some of these really great machines that work in the cell. They're amazing. They're called enzymes. So let's take a look. All right. So let's think about something delicious. Whatever it is. It's a slice of cold stone ice cream cake. It's a gyro. It's whatever it is. Um, think about your favorite food, for example. Now, think about you eat it and you immediately think, oh, you know, this is great. Now I have enough energy to go uh, get all that shopping done or do all that work or, you know, whatever it is that you need to do. And you're pretty much going to burn it off pretty quickly. You're going to take whatever it is that you've just eaten and distill it from its chemical components into waste products and energy in less than a day. That's pretty remarkable. And here's why this is remarkable. Think about it this way. If you were to take that gyro, that slice of cold stone cake, and just leave it on a plate, not even exposed really to the environment, how long would it take to decompose? Would it take a day? Take two days? Take a month? If you think about it, it could take a lot longer than that. Sometimes many tens of thousands of years, if not more. And so the reason we're able to like tear apart all these giant molecules in our food is because we're able to lower their activation energy, right? So that is the energy that we need in order to break apart those bonds. So let's take a look at how these really cool machines called enzymes start breaking apart things like our food or building things like new parts of our cells using energy. So here's a picture of what I was trying to explain. So basically, here's your reactant. So we have some sugar here, right? And in this case, the sugar is not going to just fall apart if you leave it there, right? So what happens is it has to get over an activation energy barrier before it starts breaking even the most simple bonds that are in the molecule, okay? So that requires energy to do in the first place. Oh, you have to spend money to make money. That's the idea. So an enzyme does something really special. So an enzyme actually lowers the activation energy, right? So it takes less overall energy now to start breaking apart these bonds and taking that energy out. And since it works for the cell, it's going to give it to the cell for work. So again, here's the big picture. So we have an activation energy barrier, right? So bonds really don't just break down over time. And this is a lot of little geologic universe exciting time. So we're going to require some help to get over that in order to break even a single bond. That's where enzymes come in. So an enzyme is going to help us by doing the work of breaking that bond for us. So we then release that energy for the cell to use. And now we also degrade the product so we can further break them down and hopefully we can get a little more energy out of them as well. So that's pretty great stuff, right? So we have a lot of enzymes and we have a lot of different enzymes. You don't just have one or two, you have thousands upon thousands of different enzymes in your cells that are doing all kinds of different functions. So things like um, breaking down sugars or breaking down fats, lipids, or building new cell components that you might need, okay? So what happens is we talk about them this way. So an enzyme is a biological catalyst, and a catalyst is something that, that speeds up a reaction or assists the reaction. But what's important about it is it does it without being consumed by the reaction, right? So it's still there to use later after the reaction has been completed, right? So that's how it catalyzes it. It does important things like the enzymes lower the activation energy needed in order to yay anyway so activation energy needed to break apart those bonds in the first place so they fight against having to wait for geologic time to take care of opening up those bonds right so we can just tear apart molecules or even put molecules back together or build new molecules in a really like really quickly um so the other thing is what are they made out of so typically they're going to be made out of proteins most of the time, like the lion's share. But originally some of the first enzymes and enzymes we still use now are RNA based enzymes. So that's pretty cool as well. 
So some details about enzymes, well, they're specific for the most part. Not all of them are entirely as specific as others, but some are very, very specific. And what that means is they're picky. They only want to work on one type of molecule for the most part. And so when we talk about an enzyme being selective or being specific, what we're thinking about is this other idea, what the enzyme likes to transform or work on. That's called a substrate. So remember, we have some anatomy to go over, okay? So the enzyme's active site right here, think of it as being the enzyme's mouth, okay? That's where the substrate, right, your substrate is going to go. And so it's picky. It doesn't want to have things that are the wrong shape. It's only going to take things that are the right shape, okay? So that's how we know it's being specific, right? Hence the term for that particular substrate. All right, yeah. So you guys are great, and I really appreciate how you suffer through my drawings, but we're going to use some from the textbook now, all right? So here's the Pearson list. Here's our enzyme, right? So there's some parts of the enzyme. For example, this is the active site right here where it's being kind of honey gold highlighted, okay? The enzyme itself is the purple part. So this is the enzyme itself. This one's called sucrase. And so anytime you see uh, A's in the name, you know you're dealing with an enzyme. Okay, so just kind of keep your eyes peeled for that. So this is an example of one that's empty, right? There's no substrates around, no work to be done. And here's the next step. Now we found some substrate. And in this case, since we were dealing with sucrase, we found some sucrose. Another pro tip, anytime you see os, you're dealing with a sugar. And this is an example of a sugar, okay? So in this case, the enzyme grabs onto the sugar and it fits pretty specifically because remember, enzymes have specificity into the active site. It means it puts it right into its mouth. It's very happy, right? It's a happy enzyme taking a bite of that sucrase. Now we're gonna add water. Remember we talked about hydrolysis or hydrolysis? right? So hydrolysis is going to be used to break open that bond and to let that energy out also to transform it into two separate components, right? That we can use in other downstream reactions later on. So here we have it. Now we have the energy that was released from that bond. So that was helpful. And now we've also changed our substrate. So remember originally we had sucrose Right, so it was a dimer, right? Dimer, two parts of the linkages. And it was sucrose, which was a sugar. So now if we broke those bonds, we've changed it. It's not the same anymore. Now the bond that held these two together is gone. So now what we have is glucose and fructose, two new kinds of monomers, right? Mono. Sorry, mom, not momo. I mean, I guess maybe, but mono. That's a little better. Mono meaning one, mers. So like units. Great. So we talked about enzymes being picky. And so it's not just that they're picky only for the substrate. They have to be in just the right conditions also. Because the thing about an enzyme it's usually a folded type molecule, right? And so that folded type molecule requires specific temperature or specific pH to keep things like um, those hydrogen bonds or weak bonds in the right shape, okay? If it has maybe too high of a temperature, so something maybe above 40 C in this case, or maybe the pH is too high or too low, what happens is it starts to unfold. So now when we have an unfolded enzyme, it doesn't work anymore. It's called denaturation. It's broken. Or sometimes we just say that our enzyme has melted. Okay? But denaturation is really the technical term. You're going to want to know that one. 
other things that help contribute to the specificity of enzy enzymes were telling us how they need very, very particular conditions in order to optimally execute any of their functions is going to be the idea of the cofactors and the coenzymes. So cofactors are small for the most part. They're like ions, they're pretty tiny. And coenzymes, they're usually a little bit bigger. And they're organic molecules. So an organic molecule is a molecule that has a CH bond, okay? And so these are larger usually, and these are smaller. So the function of things like cofactors and coenzymes is to make sure that we're happening, we execute or catalyze these reactions in the right amount, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, the right abundance, right? So they kind of keep it in check or in balance with the surroundings. Um, sometimes it helps us time them more appropriately. Um, right. So speaking of timing things, we also have to sometimes turn off our enzymes. We don't want them always on. So say, for example, you had an enzyme that uh, digested sugar in your body. So it's great when it's on, but what happens when there's no more sugar? It starts chewing on things, right? Like it's not specific for, but they tend to do things like loosely nibble on cell parts and membranes or DNA even, which can be a little bit dangerous for the cell. So we have what we call inhibitors. Now these are uh, different types of molecules that stop, turn down, or regulate the enzyme activity in a cell. And one of the ones we look at is we look at competitive inhibitors. So they're going to block the substrates from entering the active site. So remember if we had an enzyme, right, okay, active site right there in the mouth, what happens is they'll do something like they'll fit, so they're not the substrate, so here's the substrate, but a competitive inhibitor will sit right in the mouth and block it from chewing on any more of the substrate, right? It stops that, so it's competing for the active site hence why it's a competitive inhibitor. So now there's also another kind that we'll talk about right now, and this is called a non-competitive inhibitor. So here's our enzyme again, right? It's an awesome enzyme, super accurate, right? So here's our enzyme again, and everything's fine, and there's no competitive inhibitors anywhere, and everything's just hunky-dory, but then you have a this new thing come around, a non-competitive inhibitor, and it's really not aiming to go into the active site, but it does something a little different. So what it does is it, instead of going for the active site, usually crams itself into another part of the enzyme. It's called an allosteric site. The allosteric site doesn't necessarily fit into the active site itself, but it kind of changes the shape so that now we can't fit any of the substrate in, or it stops the enzyme from being able to function properly. Thus, it's inhibiting its ability to catalyze those reactions. So that's a non-competitive inhibitor because it's not competing for the active site. So we've learned some stuff about enzymes today, all right? And some of those things we learned are that they have an active site, they're very specific, they only wanna use a certain substrate, uh, they can be inhibited, right? So inhibitors, so there's non-competitive and competitive inhibitors, right? We also learned a little bit about stability of these enzymes, so things like uh, denaturation, right? In the process of melting. We also learned about how enzymes help us achieve uh, faster reactions by helping us overcome our activation energy and a whole bunch of other things. So I hope that was useful. All right. Well, have a nice night.